I'll never forget one of our directors, uh, Warren Shapley, said, well, you know, Bob, you're going to take this bucket of cash that you got from the public offering, $28 million, and you're going to pour it down the sink. It's going to drain the cash right out on this losing business that we couldn't take public. And I looked at him and said, no, we're not. So in 1988, following the public offering, which transformed us beyond anybody's imagination, our financial position, um, I always like to refer to Bob Lanigan, our most senior director's inspirational statement. He looked at our team one day and he said, you know guys, I've never seen anything like this. You guys need to suit up one more time. How do we create a foundation that can sustain the legacy so that we don't have to worry about our financial future? Essentially, we, we had a very few number of customers that were concentrated with our core business. We learned balance the hard way. Uh, we were highly dependent on one customer. In this case, it happened to the Anheuser-Busch. Uh, we had a history of almost 100 years of this relationship, which had served us well. We didn't change. Nothing changed on our standpoint. But their, their decision-making changed. And we went from having our largest customer reliable to doing no business with our largest customer. What we wanted to do is to broaden the base of customers so that we weren't so dependent upon you know, a, a few number of customers that could change their direction. That word balance came from that experience. We'd have a good year and then a bad year, and then maybe okay or maybe not so good. We didn't have the foundation right for the business going forward. Uh, so until that was established, it's tough to really put a growth strategy on something that, that wasn't solid. We had a sick, historic business, $28 million in the bank, and we began to shape the future with a crude thought. Our history will not provide our future. The 1990s, right up until the early 2000s, were shaped by the strategy developed in 1988, the strategy for growth, value, and liquidity. The strategy for growth, value, and liquidity was put together, and it was really an effort by Bob and the leadership team to say, what are we going to do to build a great company? And the design of the business was, okay, I understand the capital goods industry, I understand packaging, how could I design a business that had fundamentals that would not cause me to repeat the issues of the past? How do you run a business that creates sustainable value for your stakeholders when you're in a cyclical industry? What you try and do is make it non-cyclical. So our answer to that was to look for companies that had substantial aftermarket revenue. Why? Because it happens every day. Daily, weekly, monthly, people need service to uh, overhaul a machine, to bring a machine back to uh, its expected operating performance level. So the business model of building a company around the spare parts business is absolutely a genius move. Uh, because it protects on the, the downside. The uh, direction then was to expand our base into other parts of the, the industry, but not just the brewing industry and the packaging industry, to give us some stability and, and to acquire companies that uh, actually added value to Berryway Miller and also complemented our business. So we looked for companies that fit that profile. Companies with a long history and a large installed base of equipment. And of course, companies that were in financial trouble that uh, would have a motivation to sell to us. We looked for companies that had issues similar to ours that we had been able to solve so that we 
could understand what we were going to bring to the companies we aspired to acquire. We were very encouraged very early in the journey that we were on the right path. And then we went about to find businesses that would fit in the max scale was the first opportunity. The max scale opportunity came up and so we just poured a lot of energy into that. Which was a public company that was based in Boston. Uh, I went back to my board. My board said, oh, Bob, you don't want to do an unfriendly takeover. High risk, high cost. You don't want to do that. And I said, I think I do. We got through this process with great tenacity and thoughtfulness. And then we executed it massively better than we thought. And everybody was very excited about that acquisition. And the enthusiasm that was there, uh, the, the, looking at all the opportunities. So the most significant event following the 1988 was the Nemag scale, unfriendly takeover of a publicly traded company that virtually doubled our size and gave us a platform of the cereal industry, the food industry, it got us into a dramatically different profile uh, of market serve, major operation in Boston which then was followed by the next major acquisition, which was uh, the three Bemis companies that Tim and I worked on. I can remember we began talking to the Bemis company, a $2 billion publicly traded materials company based in Minneapolis. The Bemis companies, three different companies, Acroply, Bemis Packaging Machinery, and Hasen. And we became aware that Hasen had an agreement to be acquired by a German company that had fallen through. So we began a dialogue with Bemis about Hasen. The dialogue went from acquiring Hasen to acquiring all three of their packaging machinery divisions. And that meant that Barry Waymiller, which was slightly over 100 million in sales at the time, was going to double in size through this one acquisition. And I remember Bob and I walking out of the building and stopping at the front door and we were both so excited, uh, and Bob said, I can't believe that we're going to have the opportunity to acquire all three of these businesses. Those were the foundational major initiatives that changed the profile of our business and got us up into the $200 million, you know, $200 plus million business. So we kind of entered this with uh, some validation that we kind of know what we're doing now, even though it was really kind of crude. We entered the 1990s with an air of, we can do this. We were so focused on survival from 1982 to 1987, 88, that leadership was kind of a, a dream. It wasn't a reality because, you know, we were surviving. We had this interdivisional rivalry or friction or overlapping sales coverage that uh, was just really demotivating some of our top performers, frustrating to our presidents, and clearly wouldn't allow us to grow in that structure. It, it was a small family. Everyone knew everything. We, we pretty much had one sales force. It, it was you know, myself and, and a handful of other folks. But then in the late 1990s, when we acquired the three Bemis companies, they came to us with some great leadership talent, but also some established sales forces in a lot of markets. We brought on a lot of strong management team members and associates through the acquisition process. Those acquisitions opened up new markets for us. The markets in cereal packaging and, and laundry detergent, personal care products, all kinds of markets that the organization, Barry Waymiller, had never been in before. And they each brought their own unique selling structures, and it kind of got lumped on top of the selling structure within Barry Waymiller. So there wasn't a lot of thought put into selling structure and, and how each division went to market. We had three centralized selling organizations covering the regions of the world and it served us very well for a time period. The marketplace was very competitive and very territorial so not only did the major selling groups compete for kind of regional dominance or dominance of their area, the divisions were also in uh, competing for uh, you know, primary ownership of relationships. Salespeople were confused about how they were supposed to be serving the customer, confused about responsibilities, and as we were confused, our customers were very confused. The conflict was at an all-time high, and we were at war daily. And so, you know, starting to experience this growth through these variety of acquisitions, but we didn't have any momentum of culture, okay? We didn't have any philosophy of culture. I'll never forget Bob 
uh, took the time and uh, flew around the country and met with a variety of uh, salespeople and uh, sales leadership, uh, company leadership, and really thought of, you know, what's the best way to tackle this? And that was the, the birth of the E3 program. And I walked in one day and I had laryngitis. I couldn't talk. And because I couldn't talk, I had to think. And so I, I thought through the ideal way we would sell that the market would value. And then I said, here's the ideal way, but here's the way we're doing it over here. How do we inspire people to this way? And we called it the E3 program. Enhancement, empowerment, and efficiency. What E3 allows us to do and what those executives to do is to operate on a, a platform of trust. Instead of one guy on the ground for Thiele covering the market by himself, he's got seven or eight other guys in the marketplace that are potentially developing opportunities for him. The, the most valuable part of that tool is, is multiple sets of extra eyes uh, enhancing the opportunities. You know, we, as good as we all think we are in the sales field, um, extra eyes or extra vantage points certainly enhance that. We wanted to empower our salespeople to do the right thing. We wanted to enhance the selling experience and we wanted to be efficient, effective in doing so. You, you could form a team and work in harmony and come out with a successful conclusion where everybody felt good about it. E3 was a tool that allowed people to get recognition for introducing another division's products into an opportunity. And the key of the E-Cubed was that we didn't start at all with our problems. We started with the ideal. It was just stopping and saying, if I had a clean sheet of paper, what would my sales organization look like? We were forced to either learn or die. You know, uh, you have a choice. And uh, we didn't give up and it forced some creativity out of us and intensity and a discipline. But had we not been through that, I don't know that we would have developed. And, and once we got out of the survival mode, um, we got what I call ground speed a little bit. We ended up get, getting our arms around the business and more so people than anything else and really engaging people to, you know, what can we do to, to turn this business around. You start to say, well, what if we just trusted people and designed everything we're doing around that premise? That was, to me, one of the huge turning points for us as an organization at that time. The ideas for the design that could create what we hope to be sustainable value creation by leveraging the experiences we had, which were turning around businesses with good aftermarket, and, and then investing in those to create a future. What we have simply done is been able to take that, if you will, very crude initial thought based on the richness of the experiences and amplify our learnings, amplify our opportunity, and take it to scale, a scale that we never even imagined.